this is Dr. Victoria. I'm going to have Miss Vicky do the reciting. Out of Dr. V's Field Notes book is a word called apiology. I thought maybe it had something to do with apes, but no. It's from the Latin word B, apis, and the ancient Greek logia. So, epilogic is the scientific study of honeybees. Honeybees are often chosen as a study group to answer questions on the evolution of social systems, like our own. Bees are flying insects closely related to wasps and ants, known for their role in pollination and in the case of the best known bee species, the western honeybee, for producing honey. Bees are a monophyletic lineage within the superfamily Apodia. They are presently considered a clade called Anthrophila. There are over 16,000 known species in seven biological families. We have pictures of honeybees going back 8,000 years to a cave in Arana Caves in Spain. The earliest bee, one of the earliest bees going back 60 million years, excuse me Dr. B, When a bee landed, it happened to be a tree sap that later turned into an amber stone. So bees have been around forever, and they have always played a role in played a role in uh, nutrition. Uh, beeswax was used to cement pots and weapons together. Well, I mean, the pot and the weapon weren't together together, but you know what I mean. And their proteins have always been effective for medicines and trading for gold and very popular little creatures, the bee. Bye-bye. I need a little water. And I need a little brush. It's a size six silver brush, black velvet. Now this was done in gouache, but it's good and cured. So I'm going to paint some sort of a yellow flower. And the first thing I'm going to do is turn this upside down. Are y'all with me? You can't see my drawing and it's just a rough sketch. And in here I have a queen bee. So I'm just going to do some wet wetting of my paper. I'm going to take my time, because this is a fun part. I'm going to get some of this wet. Where the flower can go behind, or on top, whichever it decides it wants to do. Okay, now I'm going to get some lemon. I'm going to thin it down pretty good. Boy, that's got some green in it. That's all right. We don't care. Now, I'm going to cover the whole thing.
And where I wet is where the water is going to go. Alright, now I'm going to dry my brush off. And I'm going to come back in here and pick up some... Let me turn it around. Pick up some lights. With a dry brush. And it will pick up anything that you want. Yellow is the best color to use for underpainting because it's the lightest value pigment there is. So everything else in your palette will cover yellow. This is Fabriano Artistico paper. So it allows me to lift where if you're working with a cotton paper or an inexpensive, I mean if you're working with, let me get that back. If you're working with a student grade paper that is made of cellulose, your paint will have a tendency to soak in. I'm just going to smear that on out. Get part of that. Trying out some a different lighting today. All right, now then let's mix up a little bit of little bit of this cat orange. Just the next darker color. And the paper is still really wet. Which means I'll have a good soft edge. And take your time. This isn't a race to see who can finish first. It's actually to see who can finish most relaxed. How about that? Now see how little I've touched all this? And this color right here, I'm not sure what it is. It's the orange with a little bit of the cad red in it, so I'm going to use it. Just a little bit darker. May not use quite as much. Oops, won't matter. Because the B will either be this color or black. So now I'm still dipping in that one. I have not filled my brush again. So what does that tell you? Hello, not everybody at once. It tells you that this brush is designed to hold a lot of liquid.
and don't try to make yourself paint from your imagination. Okay, now while that's going on, I'm going to, he's kind of greenish, which we had that going on. I forgot what was what. There. It's a real dark, murky color. So we are going to do Quite dry yet. Let's see now. We don't want him. We just want him. What do we want? Let's go over. Not for any reason. I'm going to pull out a little bit where his wing is. I'm just using whatever was in my last whatever I used the last time. Now, what makes a black? You mix your three primaries together, and then you look at it, and if it's not dark enough or it's going towards blue, then you add a little bit more. And then you can test it. See? For all intents and purposes, that's black. But it's rich. It's a richer black than you get. Then just plain black. Plain black, like ivory black or lamp black, can tend to make your your artwork look dead. It looks like a blank hole. And we're going to leave that be for the time being. Let's see, I want a little of that in here. Not that much. The beauty of this palette is that it's a double primary, which means you have a cool yellow and a warm yellow. You have a cool red, warm red, cool blue, warm blue. And I'm going to let that dry, so now I'm going to come in here with some of this darker for the seeds. whatever it is this little guy is munching on. I'm 
Okay, now we've got the queen bee. If you don't feel like drawing or you just want to get straight to your painting, do that. And I know there's a size difference between the queen bee and her drones. But we're going to pretend that we want ours to be unique. But this, uh, this palette gives you a lot of freedom to learn to mix your color. I'm brushing over a smaller and smaller mark every time. Ooh, that bee is going to have some fun when we go back in there. Put some lights on him. I think this is an excellent place where I just bit on myself some shimmer. I've got palettes around here that I've used for 20 years. This was when I was practicing with just Windsor Newton. Now I could come in here after 15 years, wet that, and it'll be just like new. And here's one where I was playing with Tom Lynch's favorite pop colors, I think he calls them. They're Holbein. And then here's you can tell how old they are. Look how yellow it is. Alright, let's do... This originally came from U.S. Art Quest. And I got it at um, Hobby Lobby. Whoops, I knew I was going to do that. It needs to come out of there anyway. Each of these could go, be wet and put into a pan. Okay, now where are we? Let's um, dry this a little bit. Don't dry it until you're sure you're through with the water moving. Now, this is what I call the ugly stage. But don't quit.
Let's see. And just sit for a minute and it will get activated. See? Rinse your brush, shake it. Shake, shake, shake your booty. And see, that got con entirely away from me there because it bled into where his tail is going to go. Wet brush, laying it on there, letting it sit for just a minute. Try to leave it alone, which is difficult to do because the more you disturb that paper, the more you damage it and you don't want to damage it. Don't put pure don't put solid I mean a whole bunch of water on here. So dip your brush in the water. And shake it out. It's all about the water, folks. And I teach what I most need to learn. Controlling your water is what makes this work. There are a lot, a lot of people who paint real tight with watercolor, and that's fine if that's what you want to do. This is actually his... Uh, part of a wing. Now, if I can't get this the way I want it to be, I'll get out the goo wash. I'm joking, that's not really how you say it. Wash is opaque. Watercolor is transparent. I've got my Hemi. We won't even need the raw paint. I mean, the paint and the thingy. You know what I mean. Whoops. Clean brush. This color right here is perfect. that just a bit. white on there first. Not sure what that was doing. Oh, that was probably his leg. I could have let it dry just a bit longer. But I didn't. I'm going to let that dry and then do another coat.
the more you the more water you have in your gouache brush the more transparent it becomes so the goal is to use very little very little water just a damp brush And you kind of want to keep your watercolors and your gouache separate for that reason because one is transparent and one is not. And you'll be real unhappy if you put some gouache down and it covers up a beautiful watercolor passage. Okay? Okay. I'm just dotting that just a little bit here and there to get the the effect. put press and seal on my palette because I like it to be wet. I'm just barely touching this and I'm not I'm trying to leave part of the grayish black I have underneath so that I put down first. I'm going to get a little bit of this copper. Check, see if I'm still recording. I'm going to try some, I'm not going to try, I'm just going to do it, this yellowish gold. I 
Now doing this on top of the black, you can make your black lines smaller. She got her some real masculine drones. <laughs> I'm just cleaning up a little bit. <laughs> nope, I don't like that. And it is a whole lot easier to paint big. If this was on a big piece of paper, just the B, you could do so much with it. So don't be afraid to try it. I normally don't use my good brushes. That's another reason I don't like pans or dried up paint, because you're going to do this, and that's going to that is not that good for your brushes. beginning to look better. Being very careful with it. A good brush you can make a pencil, I mean just a hair width point. You might also get some paint on it. Now my brush will be damp. Which means that'll be more transparent, which I don't want. What's more yellow? Mellow yellow.
Okay, go back over here and get a little bit of black. Tiniest little bit of black. It's too hard to do much shading. Move, move, x -Lux. Clean paper towel. Do as I say, not as I do. Alright, now what else does our. I'm just going to stick with the wash. I left some white, sort of. Got what I was doing from one brush stroke to the next. I monkeyed that up pretty good, but that's okay. This is for journal fun.
it's okay if you don't like a particular style or process just stick with it until you find one you do what was I just gonna do? I was just, I was just gonna do something a little more black on the leg maybe I'm going to dry it. This is, um, to me, a little bit of a primitive But I come back and look at my stuff later and it's like, holy cow, I did that. If you're looking at it when you're doing it, you're way too critical. And don't think you're being neat when you throw away paint or clean it after every session. Because you're not. You're wasting paint. I was at a workshop once with a lady that did that. She squeezed out enough paint to last her for 10 paintings and then at the end of the day she took it to the sink and washed off about $40 worth of watercolor Don't do that. Don't be that woman. I'm getting a little bit of shading in these tea tiny spots. I still don't like that, but. I appreciate y'all liking and watching. YouTube looks at those sorts of things. And 
if you like it, it's how many likes there are and how many, let me get some fresh white um, comments there are. And if you like it, please subscribe. I have a free Facebook group. Oh, and if you're doing that, be sure and click the bell so you'll be the first on the block to know about when I go live. I'm going to put just a little highlight up there. See, when I've got the dry, when I got the moist. the raw paint without much water it's working a lot better for me so try that sometime and if you paint every day my late tutor and very good friend Charles Reed painted almost every day so he would fill his palette up at the beginning of the day and then the next day he would add to it and the paint on top would uh, reactivate what was on the bottom. Okay, that's enough on that. I want to do a little bit of yellowish white here on these highlights that I did just to kind of knock back that white white and I want to use a little more of this careful careful I'm just kind of dry brushing. My brush, brush is so dry that it's, uh, the dry brushing is really making a difference. Now, I'm going to get on my soapbox about good, good supplies. Buy yourself a couple of really good brushes. And these silvers are great. Princeton makes real good aqua brushes that are, I think they're called aquas. Um... Use good paper, 100% cotton, if you can. Because you will see much better results. I'm softening these little between the petals things just a little. but you'll have so much more fun with it and if you're working in mixed media do not use these brushes for mixed media your watercolor brushes are just for gouache and casing and water well you gotta be careful with that because acrylic is water based but it's permanent these brushes will last you a very very long time so keep some cheap brushes on hand. You can get, the, get them in the scrapbooking aisle, you know, wherever you buy your stuff.
and those you can mistreat you don't have to do anything special to them these you just want to keep for good stuff I want that to stand out more. I think I'm calling it quits on that one. Um, I'm thinking. Don't want anything. Around the flower. And this is, now I'm using gouache like watercolor. A little bit wetter. This is not a race, so I want you to see that mark. My brush was almost dry, see right here? And you get that scratchy look, that's called dry brush. Now that is helping make the flower stand out a little bit more. So, the flower stem will just come in and he'll fly in and, and there you have it. I'm going to take a picture of this. Thank you. 
that. Now I'll let that sit for a few days and then decide what I'm going to do with it. Alrighty. See when I've got the dry when I got the moist the raw paint without much water, it's working a lot better for me. So try that sometime. Now if you paint every day, my late tutor and very good friend Charles Reed painted almost every day. So he would fill his palette up at the beginning of the day and then the next day he would add to it and the paint on top would uh, reactivate what was on the bottom. Okay, that's enough on that. I want to do a little bit of yellowish white here on these highlights that I did just to kind of knock back that white, white. And I want to use a little more of this. Careful. Careful. I'm just kind of dry brushing. My brush, brush is so dry that it's uh, the dry brushing is really making a difference. Now, I'm going to get on my soapbox about good, good supplies. Buy yourself a couple of really good brushes. And these silvers are great. Princeton makes real good aqua brushes that are, I think they're called aquas. Um... Use good paper, 100% cotton, if you can. Because you will see much better results. I'm softening these little between the petals things just a little. but you'll have so much more fun with it and if you're working in mixed media do not use these brushes for mixed media your watercolor brushes are just for gouache and casing and water well you gotta be careful with that because acrylic is water based but it's permanent these brushes will last you a very very long time so keep some cheap brushes on hand. You can get, the, get them in the scrapbooking aisle, you know, wherever you buy your stuff. And those you can mistreat. You don't have to do anything special to them. These you just want to keep for good stuff.
want that to stand out more. I think I'm calling it quits on that one. Um, I'm thinking. Don't want anything. Around the flower. And this is, now I'm using gouache like watercolor. A little bit wetter. This is not a race, so I want you to see that mark. My brush was almost dry, see right here? And you get that scratchy look, that's called dry brush. Now that is helping make the flower stand out a little bit more. So, the flower stem will just come in and he'll fly in and, and there you have it. I'm going to take a picture of this. Take a drink. Dr. V here. This is an excerpt from my book, read to you by Miss Vicky. The second maze is about a lotus. The stems and roots of the lotus plant go deep and burrow in the mud. And you can 
if you imagine it, see the roots going into a maze and finding its way to the center to a bud, a lotus bud. And this lotus bud comes up out of the water and blooms into a gorgeous lotus. And then when the evening comes, the flower closes up and goes back into its watery existence. On top of being beautiful, they have many uses. The main one is spiritual, especially in the Buddhist faith. They are known for their rebirth from the deep, if you can imagine. They come up out of the mud, totally clean and fresh every day. The plant itself is edible, with certain preparation, of course. The uh, flowers are sold for flower arrangements. The seed pods are dried <clears throat> for decorative uses, and you see them everywhere. It looks like the end of a watering bucket. I think the most amazing use is in biochemistry, where the proteins of the fibers of the plant help chemists and engineers study ways to utilize this for future medicines. And what I want is a lotus robe. Is that interesting? It is called lotus silk. It's from the lotus plant fibers and is produced only at Inley Lake, Myanmar, and in Siena, Siem Reap, Cambodia. The thread is used for weaving special robes for Buddha. The lotus motif is also found in architecture and for fabric painting, along with many, many, many other um, illustrations of the flower. They expel many seeds that can live dormant in dried mud for thousands of years without water. The, to the Egyptians, the flower represents the universe. In the Hindu culture, it is said that gods and goddesses sat on lotus thrones. And a long-standing Buddhist story states that Buddha appeared atop a floating lotus. In his first footsteps on earth, left lotus petals in his path. I think that's just cool. Okay, back to art. And now, we're going to work on that one. And I'm going to put this up. Just dry up what's kind of not dry. Pull those off. Close that down. Did you forget it again? That's the lid and that's the bottom. Got it. I'm a sucker for a toy. This little thing just nests right down in there. And this good. You are good. So there's a backwards. There. Fits just like it's supposed to. Well, Alright, we'll go full with that some other time. I forgot how it works. Okie dokie. Now, moving right along.
I sketched on this paper. Same concept, except I want a uh, water lily. see how we do on this. This time, I'm going to do the flower all in gouache. I'll show you guys what I'm looking for, looking at. Last time wasn't much to look at. Okay. That little flower right there. It will be better if I turn it this way. For me. I'm going to paint that right in the middle. And I need to spray this again. And I need a pellet knife. Where are you, pellet? Oh, well, that'll work. It's a bone folder. Now I'm going to need some pink, which I will get from there. better pink. This is a rose. I'm not used to having a rose on my palette. And this is not going to take much paint at all. Sound of spring. The lawnmower start. Closed up. Get everything arranged here. Okay, so we've got to have a real pretty green. I'm going to put some of this yellow over here. Look at the, I'm just going to draw this commando. Look at the height of your leaves in relation to the tulip. So if I go about halfway, I'm going to be pretty good. A little more yellow.
And then we've got our little one that comes up like it's just about to open and goes back down and then around. I'm painting these all the same color just as a little block in. And then now we've got one that comes like this. No, not like that because that's too big. Like this. very light pink and the top of my flower is okay what we're going to do I didn't do that little thing it's alright it's all right. very light This comes up like that. And this one over here comes up like that. All right, there. There. Now let's go back into our light pink. I'm keeping it real light. Then we have another point. See, flowers are fun because nobody knows what you were looking at. Alright, there's our block in. get real quiet. Okay, now I need a yellower.
Careful there, no Rambo. I don't think I want to paint this little. There are people who love it and do it well. Just don't think that's me. I invite you to put on some of your music. Okay, I'm gonna get. I'm gonna dull that green down just a bit with a reddish color. Now I'm gonna add some form color here. Wello, wello. Alrighty, let's go back to our really light pink and pull this down to white. See how much white you go through? A lot.
What have I done? Oh no! Oh, I picked up that dirty rag again. I'm just, this is damp. And I'm going to put a, a lot of water on it. Damn it. Well. Let it sit. Things happen. That's what Photoshop is good for. Thank you.
I'm about done. Now I might come back after this is all dry and add some more white to some of these. Alrighty. 